As he ends his letter to the Galatians, he says in the 14th verse of chapter 6, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world is crucified to me, and I am crucified to the world. Now there's a thing you and I have never seen. We have never seen the agonizing death of a man on a cross. Immediately a man was nailed to the cross, he lost all his rights. And if you ever get nailed to the cross, you'll lose all yours too. Paul never glamorized the gospel. It's a pretty gory gospel. It's a bloody gospel. It's a sacrificial gospel. I believe the cardinal ethic of Christianity is sacrifice. Not success, sacrifice. Five minutes inside eternity, I believe every one of us will have wished that we'd sacrifice more. Prayed more, loved more, sweated more, grieved more, wept more. First Corinthians chapter 3, reading from verse 1. And I, brethren, <clears throat> could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? <clears throat> who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers by whom he believed even as the Lord gave to every man I have planted Apollos watered but God gave the increase so then neither is he that planteth anything neither he that watereth but God that giveth the increase One of the most forgotten men in the church, at least amongst the so-called great men, <clears throat> was a man by the name of Henry Varley. He was a great preacher, and on one occasion he shot out a statement which has come a kind of, become a kind of classic in the vocabulary of preachers. He said, the world is yet to see what God can do through one man who is totally committed to Jesus Christ. Well, it was a kind of an arrow shot at a venture. <clears throat> uh, but in the audience, there was a young man. He, he wasn't very learned. His education was almost zero. But he kind of caught that thought as it went past. No, no man, the world has not yet seen a man who is 100% committed to Jesus Christ. And so he said under his breath, well, by the grace of God, I'll be that man. All he did was sell shoes in a store there in Chicago. And some of you know him, I'm sure. His name was D.L. Moody. But you know, when I think of that, I always take issue with it because I'm quite sure that that was not a true statement. The world is yet to see. Are you suggesting God had had to wait 2,000 years that Jesus had to find a man that he could totally inhabit because all self and sin had been purged out of him and his will had been surrendered and his personality, uh, he was a love slave to God? Why, right at the beginning of history, Christian history, there was a man who was so totally sold out to God that we, I don't think I've ever seen his like since. You remember his story begins, as far as we're concerned, going down the Damascus Road. And in the 26th of Acts, where he gives his testimony before Agrippa, <coughs> he, he, he doesn't cover the blemishes. He, he doesn't try to minimize the, the wicked zeal that he has. He, he doesn't say, I'm sorry and trembling and blushing, that I, I, I have to admit that I was a murderer. He, he says, I went down that, uh, that road and I was going to exterminate the whole church of Jesus Christ. Being exceedingly mad, he says. Not just mad, he was blazing with anger. 
to think that some people were following a man who died on a cross To think they wouldn't go to the temple and offer sacrifices and regard the high priest and, and go through all the different and uh, very wonderful things on the calendar of the church or their church. But going down that Damascus road, <coughs> God got hold of that murderer and made him a messenger. He got hold of the persecutor and made him the greatest preacher ever. He, get, he got hold of the executor and made him the greatest expounder of the gospel that the world has ever seen. He says, giving his own testimony, that when he went down that Damascus road, that the, the Lord appeared unto me. He revealed himself to me. But later he says, he revealed himself in me. He daringly says over and over, you remember Galatians 2.20 quoted so often, uh, that, that I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. I believe that's the most awesome thing any man can say this side of eternity. Not that he walked on the moon. Not that it's in the who's who. The only who's who I'm interested in, God's who's who. <laughs> When we get up there, there'll be some shocks, I think. The greatest thing that could ever cross your lips is to stand and say to the world, the flesh, the devil, the in-laws and outlaws, Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, not when I shuffle off this mortal coil, as Shakespeare says, but the life I now live in the flesh, surrounded with all the adversities and temptations and trials, and all the things that can come, and yet Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, <clears throat> I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul has an amazing pedigree. He forgets it all. <coughs> As he ends his letter to the Galatians, he says in the 14th verse of chapter 6, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world is crucified to me, and I am crucified to the world. Now there's a thing you and I have never seen. We have never seen the agonizing death of a man on a cross. Oh well, of course, in the days of the Romans, it was a sport. Immediately a man was nailed to the cross, he lost all his rights. And if you ever get nailed to the cross, you'll lose all yours too. Immediately he was nailed on the cross and he was exalted. The people could do as they like. They could throw a bucket of filth on him. They could throw their rotten eggs. They could stone him. He had no rights. And before he died, his eyes would be gouged out. His ribs would be broken. Blood would be dripping from him. And everybody got excited, particularly if it was a kind of a Barabbas who was there. He deserves all he gets. He, he's destroyed other people's lives. He's raped people. He, he, he's broken people's minds. And, and so they go on with a list of things that he'd done. And he should die a thousand deaths. But as soon as the bell tolled in the city, they didn't stay there. They went back into the city. At six o'clock, they could see that bleeding victim. There was nobody there at six o'clock in the morning. On the arms of the cross were the vultures. They'd pick out the eyes, they'd tear the body, the blood would run out. Then the dogs came out of Jerusalem and, and, and licked up the, the, the blood as they did the blood of Jezebel. Nobody wanted to photograph it, they didn't have photography, but nobody wanted to see it. A bloody spectacle. A man whose innards were hanging out. A man whose body is so distorted you could hardly tell it was a human frame. It had been lashed with rocks, it was covered with filth. It had only excrement and every other offensive thing. And Paul says, when I said goodbye to the world, I said goodbye to a filthy thing. The world is crucified to me. It's a filthy world. It's a corrupt world. But not only that, he says, I'm crucified to the world. People would say of the Apostle Paul, here's a man, he's got acres of culture. He's got a colossal intellect. He'll be a greater high priest than Hillel or any other high priest we ever had in history. And the fool of a man, 
He's been so charmed with this Christianity that he's resigned all that he could have in the world. Yeah, it's easy for you and I to sing with eyes of quartz, were the whole realm of nature mine. <laughs> I'm afraid we don't do it. Love so amazing, so divine. This man had a revelation of God that I don't think anybody's had before or since. I'm quite sure he quoted with fervency, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He sees the great expanse of the world. Why, look at this man's staggering life. He began his life in the historic capital of the world, Tarsus. He ended his life in the military wo uh, capital of the world, Rome. He went to the intellectual capital of the world. But then, as a great preacher says, he took the trumpet of the resurrection. He went down the street, and when he saw the street, it was lined with churches, as we would say. It was lined with places of worship. Oh, this, 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 this doesn't stagger too many of us, does it? We, we just go down the street and say, there's a Roman Catholic church, that's Jehovah's Witnesses, that's the Mormons where the Hare Krishna meet there, and the Muniites meet there, and so what? Does it stir you that those people have been treating, tre teaching false gods and they rape people's minds just as a man might rape a girl's body? It says in the sleepy Elizabethan English that when he saw all these people, colossal intellects, many of them, and yet they were tricked and duped by false religion, and it says in the sleepy Elizabethan English that his spirit was stirred within him. I'm not very fond of the Amplified, except where it agrees with me. <clears throat> but uh, the Amplified doesn't say his spirit was stirred within him. He says that when he saw all these people tricked, seduced by, by, by deceiving spirits, he was angry about it. Do, do, do you ever feel a holy anger? And he sounded the resurrection. You see, they did have an altar to an unknown God, and he said, that's the unknown God I declare to you. He made the heavens and the earth. His son died and rose again, and, and he was resurrected. And they showed him the gate. No, we can't listen to that kind of stuff. From there, he went from the intellectual capital of the world, and he'd been also... Later, later he'll go to the religious capital of the world, Jerusalem, but he steps down from the place where they worship the brain to the place where they worship the body, Corinth. In the days of the apostle, you didn't have to string a hundred adjectives together about a man's corruption and his licentiousness and everything else. You just tagged him with one word. He's a Corinthian. And immediately you knew he was the vilest of the vile. Blessed and sublime miracle of God, that a church of Jesus Christ could be established in Corinth? Shakespeare said you can't make a, a silk purse out of a sow's ear. God can do better than that. He can take the most depraved, despised and rejected men and make them saints to God. It says in the first of Samuel there, he lifts the beggar from the dunghill and makes them princes unto God. I remember about 15 or 16 years ago when we were working with Dave Wilkerson in those days when David was hardly known, and yet we had a full house. This side of the prayer chapel was filled with girls, this with men, and a little fellow stood up and he said, Brother Raveney, let's come to preach for us. The little Puerto Rican fellow, his face was radiant, and he said, before he sing, we stand up and sing. Sing the national anthem. Oh, I thought, baloney, sing the national anthem right before I preach. <laughs> I didn't get what he said. He didn't say sing the national anthem. He sing our national anthem. He said, we sing our national anthem. So I thought the Puerto Ricans must have one. <laughs> and he stood up there and you know, he started to sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. It was grace that taught my... It was grace. 
And you know, before we got to the end, when we'd been there 10,000 years, he changed it to 10 million. Well, it wasn't bad. 10 trillion would have been better, but <coughs> he, 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 he got there. And you know, there wasn't a dry eye. On the, those girls had been prostitutes. Some of them had carried guns. Everyone had been changed. The tears were flowing. They used to make other people weep. Now they're weeping. Why? Amazing grace. Sure, Paul loved the word. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And then afterwards he writes to Ephesians. He not only loved the, the world and gave his son, he says he loved me. But he says Christ gave himself for the church. But greater than loving the world and loving the church, he says, do you know what he did? He loved me. Do you ever fall at his feet and say, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul, not our souls? Thank you for blotting out the horrible record of my sin. And it's true that those who have been saved from much love much. You remember that brilliant king? He was mentioned this morning in Psalm 51. And in another psalm, he says what? He lifted me up out of a horrible pit. This hand was running with crime and, and this with adultery. And my history was rotten. And he's not asking, Lord, uh, just, just to kindly forgive my sins and uh, I'll go about my business. He's not asking for some superficial knowledge that somehow the relationship is kind of restored and all is well. He goes further than that. He says, search me in a Psalm 139 and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. He says in that 51st Psalm, I want truth in the inward parts. Oh, that's cutting close, isn't it? Not just out of my mind and my conscience, but in the inward part, the, the central register of my being, that truth may be there. Paul finishes his letter to the Galatians. Oh, it, it's so beautiful. He doesn't have his tongue in his cheek and say, you know, I wonder if I've done the right thing. I could have had a good influence for, for God if I'd stayed in the old place and uh, I'd uh, had a worldwide reputation and... Uh, no, 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 no. I like what he says at the end of the chapter there. <coughs> I'm reading from the Living Bible, King James. Uh, <coughs> and <laughs> the 17th verse of the last chapter says this. I like it. Listen to his defiance. From henceforth, let no man trouble me. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. I think Moffat translates that. Henceforth, let no man trouble me. I bear in my body the brands of Jesus Christ. Oh, they knew what he meant in the temple of Heracles. In the days of slavery. A man would run away from his taskmaster, brutal taskmaster. And he would rush to the temple. They had priests there. They were, they were on guard day and night. Often asleep, but anyhow, that's what preachers are. And you might have to wake the uh, preacher up and, and you say, I, 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 Oh, he says, have you escaped? Yes, I've escaped. Uh, uh, brand me, brand me. Well, choose the weapons. What, what, you know, like we brand cattle here. Uh, which God do you want to be branded with? He, he chooses the, the, the mark, the brand of a certain God, and he's branded on his hands. Can you imagine him putting his hand out, clenching his teeth, uh, and that flesh sizzles when that hot iron goes on it? He slips down his toga if he was wearing one, and he's branded on the back of his neck. He lifts up his foot, and he's branded on his instep. Paul says, don't trouble me. I'm branded. I bear the marks of a slave. I'm a bond slave of Jesus Christ. I've no will of my own. I've no rights of my own. There's an old hymn established on that very theme. Let my hands perform his bidding. Let my feet run in his ways. Let my eyes see Jesus only. Let my lips speak forth his praise. All for Jesus. All my being's ransom powers. All my thoughts and words and doings. All my days and all my hours. This man is no professional preacher. Preaching is not a profession, it's a passion. If a man can't preach with passion, he shouldn't preach at all. Not a profession, a passion. 
There's no breath of professionalism anywhere in the ministry of Paul, and thank God there's no breath of commercialism either. Peter said in his day, there are some who will make merchandise of you. And that couldn't be more true than the day in which we're living. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. I bear here at the back of my neck a brand which tells you that this part of my being, my thinking, my philosophy is that of Jesus Christ, my teaching, my feet. Isn't it staggering how, how, how far this amazing man went? Look at his missionary journeys without airplanes, without trains. God put something in him. The stupid world tried to get it out of him. But God put something, something in him and, and they lashed him 195 times and they couldn't whip it out of him. And he hung on a piece of wood in the Mediterranean for 36 hours and they couldn't wash it out of him. And they tried to threaten it out of him. But Almighty God put something in there, you see. They were not trying to kill the Apostle Paul, the idiots. They were trying to kill Jesus Christ. Because Christ lived in him. <coughs> he says his life is hid with Christ in God. <coughs> so you see this man moving, establishing churches. One amazing thing, and I, I, I often say this to young preachers who ask me about preaching, and I don't know much about it. I've been trying to do it for about 60, or oh, just over 60 years now. It's still a mystery, I think, as dear pastor said this morning. You see, some people have got everything out in one, two, three, four. If they have, I throw the book away. The older I get, the more I realize great is the mystery of godliness. Why isn't God brooding over our stained glass windows in America this morning? Why isn't he brooding on our super multi-million dollar TV and radio programs with all the flash and show they have? The greatest areas where God is breathing this morning is amongst people that are in poverty and in need. But uh, in the Wall Street Journal for the 11th of July, it says, I was going to bring the document and I forgot it, but it says there, <coughs> An evangelical revival is moving over America just now, but it's having little effect. That's like saying there was an earthquake from California to New York last night, 8.6 on the Richter scale, but nobody felt it. You talk about the fullness of God. What, what Paul did, you know, right after he was born again, after that miracle happened on the Damascus Road. I'm glad one man stayed to listen what God had to say that morning. He didn't just pray. He listened and God said, Ananias, get up and go to the street, call straight, and that's the house. Isn't it great to know that God knows your name and address? Postman may forget it, but God knows it. And he goes down and says to him, Brother Saul, that must have startled him. I mean, he was going to kill that man. And he goes and says, Brother Saul, the Lord hath appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister. And you know, only God can make you a minister. Nobody else can do that. They may teach you a few things in Bible school, but they never make you a preacher. The Lord hath appeared to thee. And then he disappears. <clears throat> He goes into the wilderness. God revealed himself in him. I hope you understand my language here. I believe in that period of three and a half years that Paul became spiritually pregnant. I believe the Spirit of God birthed all these epistles which afterwards he would give birth to. I believe he birthed all those churches because he writes afterwards, doesn't he, to the Galatians. And he says, little children, for whom I travel in birth. You talk about out of him shall flow rivers of living water. Fourteen epistles if you give him Hebrews, and I think he wrote Hebrews as well. Fourteen matchless epistles. I remind you again, Christianity was not served up to the world on a silver platter. Christianity 
were served up or it was born in a sophisticated totalitarian society. And yet Jesus never said anything about slavery. All these boys are rushing to Washington. They then put God's house right, but they want to put the White House right. The answer to our present moral and political and every other dilemma we have in the nation will not be solved in the upper room at the White uh, in, uh, pardon me, in the Oval Room at the White House. It will be solved, if it's solved at all, in the upper room in God's house. The way the preachers are rushing to Washington, you'd think that the politicians were the salt of the earth. They're not. They can't put their own house in order, never mind us. God strictly forbid that Israel should go down to Egypt for help and all these boys are rushing to the politicians. They want to get the Bible back in school. Well, I'm not too worried about that. I'd like to see the Bible back in every home. Then forget the school. Some of us want the school teacher to do what daddy and mummy should do. No man surveyed the cross, the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died like the Apostle Paul. My richest gain I count but lost. Yes, sir, he did it over and over and over again. After all, if you lay the cross on the ground, it points north, south, east and west. It has a message for the whole world. If you stand it up, it points to a topless heaven and a bottomless hell. And the arms, as Charles Wesley said, the arms of love that compass me would all mankind embrace. Paul has no fear. Do you know what he did? I would to God some of you fellows would do it. Do you know what he once did? He said, I bow the knee to the Father. And because he bowed the knee to the Father, he never bowed the knee to anybody else. Neither demons or politicians or kings. He stood there, regal. Isn't it something that there's a, a man there suave and in his gorgeous robes and his uh, beautiful rings and all society gasping when Felix walks in? And before he finished, Felix's knees were knocking together. It says Felix trembled. He goes to one of the most distinguished men of the day and what does he say? You almost persuade me to be a Christian. I'm on the very verge of it. Paul says, I would to God that you were even as I am, except for these chains. <coughs> Isn't that lovely? He has his chains on. The difference between Paul and the man on the throne, the man on the throne had chains, but they were on the inside. Paul's chains were on the outside. He had none on the inside. He was free. Free from the fear of men. Free from the fear of consequences. Free from anything the devil might put on him or other people. From henceforth he says, let no man trouble me. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. I'm afraid that Paul would look on with compassion and real pity on our feeble faith. I sometimes say this is a day of thin theology and fat preachers. And I'm sure it is. There's no sentimental Christianity with the Apostle Paul. There's no such thing as coming to the cross and just getting your sins forgiven. Oh, no, 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 no. The man who only wants his sins forgiven is trifling with Christianity. He needs more than his sins forgiven. He needs more than that, that horrid record. Maybe you sin enough to damn a thousand people. And God in his infinite mercy, when you confess and you plead and you're broken hearted and you're penitent and you repent, he takes that record and flings it into his eternal backyard. It's like never to be remembered against us anymore forever. But man needs more than forgiveness. He needs cleansing. He needs more than cleansing, he needs indwelling. He needs to get to read to the bondage of sin, he becomes a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Now I said Paul came to the, in, the intellectual capital where they worship the brain and he came down to Corinth where they worship the body. The continual talk in Athens was wisdom. The continual talk in Corinth was wickedness. I, I don't read he sent out a letter asking for support to get there. I don't read he made reservations in the Holiday Inn or somewhere. This man is prepared to follow the step of Jesus every way as far as possible. 
Somebody said to a friend of mine recently who might be doing some building for God, he said, listen, get me give you a word of advice. Don't build anything that will embarrass you in a few years. That's a very good point. I see God's money going in stately buildings and swimming pools and tennis courts and I want to vomit. With the world starving, with the mission field needing money. Paul attacks Corinth. Well, uh, he, he doesn't go with his philosophical stuff. He, he, he doesn't dazzle them with his knowledge. He says, listen, he begins the epistle, doesn't he, by saying, I, I, I'm not coming to you with enticing words of man's wisdom. Almost saying, I just tried that out at the last place and those, those philosophers and Stoics and Epicureans and others, they, uh, they marveled, they opened their eyes, they were, they were staggered by what I said, but I didn't get through to them. And so I'm going right back, back, back to the foundation. Some years ago, there was a professor in America, his book has recently been republished. <coughs> I think, I'm not sure if he was at Yale, no, Princeton. He was only in his 40s when he contracted a terrible disease. His body began to droop, he began to shuffle. He tried to get an answer to his problem and he couldn't and so one day somebody said to him, you need to go to Paris, there's a doctor there. Now this was when ships were slow, not even fast ships and certainly no planes. When he got to Paris, somebody said to him, no, 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 we don't have the answer. Uh, I, I think you'll find it in Geneva. And Geneva, they said, no, we, we don't have the answer here. The answer is in Austria. He got to Austria and somebody said, no, the answer is in France. He got to France, they said, it's across the channel in England. In England, they said, no, 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 we don't have the answer. The, the, the physician who has the answer is there in Scotland. When he got there, the physician says, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't have the answer to it. We've done some investigation, but we've got no answer. Like our day, we can diagnose cancer, we can't cure it. We're so p busy putting billions into armaments, we let folk die on our doorstep. So we'll have enough stuff to destroy other countries. Isn't that wonderful? Don't have the answer. He came back. He was tempted on the ship almost to throw himself overboard. One day he was going down the street not far from Princeton. A man said to him, excuse me, sir, aren't you Professor James? He said, yes. Well, you're very sick. Isn't it amazing people state the obvious? You're sick. You need to find a, a deliverer. Friend, there's no deliverance. I've been all over Europe. I've spent a fortune. Sir, he said, if you go down the street and knock on the door of so-and-so and tell him, John sent you. Why? Does he have the answer? Mm -hmm. The professor went and knocked at the door. Just a little laboring man came. His hands were not, you know, those smooth, gentle hands that could take a scalpel and do surgery. They, they were all knotted and gnarled and, and the man obviously wasn't very well educated. <coughs> the professor said, <laughs> Uh, as you see, I, I, I have a terrible disease and it's, it's, it's galloping, it's, it's getting hold of me quickly and I, I do want to get rid of it and I understand you have a cure for it. And the man said, well, uh, I can pray for you. The professor said, what? He, he said, I can pray for you. Uh, I, I, can, uh, I can put some oil on your head and... Uh, Professor James said, my psychology was saying, that won't work. And my pride was saying, you can't kneel in front of this ignoramus, you with a couple of PhDs and all. But you see, the PhDs didn't do anything for him. And all his philosophy didn't do anything for him. So he went in the house. And he said, sir, whatever you say, I'll do it. The man said, kneel down. He knelt down. The little fellow got some oil, put it on his hand. Papa would have enjoyed doing this. Put some oil on his head. The professor's waiting. He thought some flash would come from heaven or something. The man put his trembling hands on the head of the, the great professor. And he said a few things and then he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, be made whole. The professor jumped out. 
I felt as though 10,000 volts of electricity touched me. Oh, yeah, my legs are all right. Yeah, I'm great. I, I, don't, I don't know how it happened. The little man said, I don't either. <laughs> Except that God was faithful to answer prayer. The point is he went halfway around the world in order to answer, find an answer. And we're going all around the world. We're trying to find an answer through psychology and para this and para that and heaven knows what. And the answer is in the old rugged cross so despised by the world. It's got every answer to our human dilemma, even sickness and mental disorders. But I don't care how you emphasize the tragedy that Adam brought into the world. Are you going to suggest to me that there is no way where that human heart can be cleansed? Did, did Satan pollute the very foundation of, of human society and, and God has no answer to th that pollution? I like that hymn, Break Thou the Bread of Life. I like the phrase in it that says, that then shall all bondage cease and all fetters fall. Paul had seen men and women redeemed from corruption. He'd seen them transformed and now he's writing to them 18 months afterwards. And he says, ye carnal, ye carnal, the point I want to emphasize is this. He says, you, you, you're babes in Christ. You know, when a man is going to split a diamond, he, he has to be very steady. He'll look at it from different angles. He'll, he'll magnify any little crack. He could split the wrong way and just be no more valuable than uh, much glass. He's very, very careful. Or in England, we guard the Queen's jewels, the crown jewels. They're surrounded with, with an electric fence. You can't steal them. It's an impossibility. Nobody ever tried yet anyhow. I think of Michelangelo when he was cutting the head of David out of stone or his Pieta. Careful lest, ooh, one slip. And that original piece would mean that the nose was chipped off or the ear. And it would be spoiled. But no man ever cut a diamond Michelangelo never worked with more accuracy. No mother ever had a child that burned the heart like the care that the Apostle Paul gave to his church. The tragedy with so much evangelism is we, we record them as statistics and the preacher goes on next night. This Apostle Paul was no, 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 uh, fly by night evangelist. The most precious thing we ever handle is the human soul. The Pieta one day will go up in dust. The Sistern Chapel will be blown to smithereens. But the soul of a man will live forever and ever and ever and ever. Either in eternal darkness or eternal bliss. Heaven is impeccable joy. There'll be no sorrow. Hell is eternal misery. There's no joy. There is only one way to heaven. There are a million ways to hell. What do you do to go to hell? Nothing. Just do nothing, that's all. You don't have to thumb your nose at God. You don't have to blaspheme the name of Jesus. You don't have to be adulterer. Just coast on. For the greatest sin in the world is not adultery. The greatest sin in the world is I can manage my life without God. That's the greatest thing. Paul has established the church, but now he's deeply, deeply concerned about them. He says they're babes in Christ. Uh, wh wh why is Paul arguing here with these people? He says, because I feed you with milk and not with meat. You've no digestible, you've no spiritual digestion. Well, listen. In America alone right now, we have, I dare to say this before God, I believe we have hundreds of millions of gospel cassettes. And we've millions of gospel books. And we've hundreds of Bible schools. And, and we've hundreds, over the year, we have hundreds of seminars. And we have people memorizing the scriptures. And we have about 5,000 radio stations who every day give some part of the scripture. And yet with all this stuff to feed on, 
dear God, where are we with all this stuff to feed on? 95% of us are spiritual cripples, spiritual infants, spiritual babes. Oh, it's not the only time he says that in Ephesians 4. Where is it? And verse 14, he, he, he's, he, he's careful about the Ephesians there, Ephesians 4, 14, that henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive you. He's fearful for the Ephesians. Babes in Christ. Because they're babes, they're not able to carry burdens. I can remember when I was a little boy, I'd go into the garden. We had a flower garden, as we say in England, a vegetable garden. And uh, I'd try and pick up a bucket of potatoes, and I'd strain, and Dad'd say, put it down, you'll hurt your back. When I got to be about 13, I'd go in, I'd see half a bucket, and I'd pick that up and carry the half bucket. Father said, put it down, you'll carry the full one, you're strong enough to carry it now. If God Almighty only gives us strength or burdens equal to our strength, we'll be in a bad way. What we need is, is strength for the burdens of this day. I don't believe the church of Jesus Christ has ever faced the hostility. I believe the world today and in areas of the church is filled with lying spirits and doctrines of devils. Paul is jealous for the old rugged cross. And you remember what he says? There are some people who are enemies of the cross of Christ. Now notice what he says. He doesn't say they're enemies of Christ. Oh no, they're smart enough to use the name. The Mormons use the name of Jesus. The Mormons say they have gifts of the Spirit. The Jehovah's Witnesses talk about Jesus and the kingdom. But they're enemies of the cross. It's the blood that is an offense to them. They're enemies of the cross of Christ. I wonder what it's say in our day. I say going down the streets in Athens, his spirit was stirred. He was angry. Babies, children, full of self-pity, self-interest, self-seeking, self-concern. Me first. I never heard of children choosing to fast. I can heard them, I've heard them uh, uh, when they turn their nose up, you know, at spaghetti or something like that. It wouldn't be Italians if they turn their nose up at spaghetti, but uh, some other things, you know. You, usually it's cabbage, isn't it? Ooh, spinach. <laughs> no, no, no. They want to be very choosy in what they eat and what they drink. You say sometimes, I wonder God doesn't burden me. Do you know why? Because he can't trust you, that's why. You're not strong enough to carry the burden. Isaac Watts, who wrote, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, also said this, If God Almighty should call me to control six universes, not six worlds, six whole universes, I would joyfully do it because he give compensating grace. But he said, I wouldn't want even to look after six sheep without his guidance. Oh, it's easy to be emotional. There's nothing wrong with emotion. You've got to have some emotion. But it's wrong when that's all there is. Children, they love people, but they only love emotionally. Who do they love most? Oh, Auntie Bessie. Of course, her sister's a far nicer personality, but her sister happens to be poor. So when they hear Auntie Bessie comes, they climb up at the windows. She's coming, she's coming. Why? Because she always brings a gift. And they just love her on that basis because she gives and gives and gives. And some people love God because he gives. We've got this wretched prosperity stunt. Paul's very clear, isn't he? Doesn't, doesn't he say, uh, well, writing to Timothy there, that you'll come a day when people think that gain is godliness? Some of God's choicest saints don't have another shirt to change. If ever God was looking for men who 
as we would say, square their shoulders and carry the burden it's in this day in which we live. If ever we need to be alert that we don't get caught and trapped in false doctrine, it's the day in which we live. If ever there was a day when we should put on the whole armor of God, God in heaven, you know. Don't send babies to battle. They want bottles, not battles. They want the nursery, not the armory. How often do you go to a prayer meeting where you feel there's real engagement against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world? One of the most awesome things, I think, that Jesus ever said was to his disciples, I give you power over the enemy. No, 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 over all the power of the enemy. And it includes sickness, I admit that. But it doesn't mean that merely. There's only one power that can withstand the onslaught that's on all the nations of the earth right now. And that is the church of Jesus Christ anointed with the Holy Ghost. And there's an old saying that all is fair in love and war. <clears throat> and I'll tell you what, if you stir hell up, he'll, the devil will stir everything he can against you. You'll get misunderstood, misrepresented. And if you are not thick-skinned, no, 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 it's not if you're thick-skinned. If you're not mature enough, it'll get you down. It's not the contradiction of sinners that gets you down, as Psalm 1 says. It's the criticism of saints that gets you down. Because at the end of Romans 8, he says, yes, I've had tribulation, distress, famine, peril, and nakedness, sword, all these things. He puts his shoulders back and says to the devil, listen, there's nothing present. There's nothing in things to come. There's nothing in height. There's nothing in depth. There's nothing in any other creature that can separate me from the love of God. So go back to hell where you came from. You're wasting your time. You can separate me from the church. But are tens of thousands of precious believers in jail this morning, in hell holes. Paul's blind, he says, I see neither Jew nor Greek, nor bondman nor freeman. If I see a king and he has a gold crown and all his ritual, so what? In the sense of him, he's dead. Because you see, there are only two kinds of people in the world, those who are dead in sin and those who are dead to sin. Babes in Christ. One mark is stubbornness. As a young lady, I think, testified this morning of stubbornness, unwillingness to do what God says. <coughs> a lot of you here this morning, you don't need more light. So this, this will only make it worse for you at the judgment. What you need is more obedience. Some of you have known for years what you should do, and you hold back. Children are very touchy, aren't they? Of course, you rationalize this. You say, no, the, the, your trouble is you're so touchy. I'm not touchy, I'm sensitive. You're full of pride. I, I just have a lot of self-respect. You've got a bad temper. I have uh, righteous anger. <clears throat> You can always work it out, can't you, if you want to. I self-respect, you're full of pride. But aren't children very touchy? Aren't they very easily offended? You know, some of us are not only offended at what comes from other people, we're offended at what God says to us. One mark of carnality is stubbornness. It used to be a great school. It isn't, well, it's got another name now. It used to be in Chicago in 1950 when I first went there. I've forgotten its full name. It was an evangelical something. And at that time, Dr. Harry Jessup was the pastor. He came to England and preached. I remember him saying his, his sister had a beautiful little girl, just, just a model little girl. And she was pretty spoiled. And she always had pretty clothes. And she had a pretty good mind, and uh, she, she knew a poem with about 12 stanzas. 
And the relatives were coming to dinner, and Mother said, Now, darling, I bought you a new dress, and after dinner, I'm going to stand you on that chair, and <laughs> you're going to say your poem. Yes, Mummy. <coughs> and when dinner was over, Mother said, I want you to hear now what, what Peggy's learned. She has learned such a lovely poem. It's got about ten lines in each stanza. There are twelve stanzas, and my little daughter, four, is going to recite it for you. Come on, darling. She stood on the chair, and little Peggy stood up and went, <clears throat> but mother said, Peggy, say your piece. <laughs> Peggy, say your piece. If you don't, you're going upstairs. Peggy again. Mother took her upstairs and put in a big old cupboard they had and put the latch on. And sure enough, she got so lost in the party, she forgot Peggy was up there. Oh, Peggy's upstairs. Poor little mite. When she got up there, she heard a noise. And this is funny. She opened the door, there was Peggy, and she said, Are you going to say your piece? She said, No. What were you doing just now? She had a nice little list. She said, spitting. I spit on your dress. I spit on your fur. I spit on your shoes. And I'm just waiting for more spit. <laughs> In other words, she'd made up her mind. She wasn't going to do as mummy says. Now, let's, let's break this down for a minute. He says, your babes. And he diagnoses the trouble. He says, there is among you envy and pride and division and the scripture says envy is as rottenness of the bones you say well I've been troubled with pride I, I know even more since I was saved I, I've been troubled with bad temper I've been troubled with envy I, I, I've been troubled with doubt come on what are you going to do with it I've asked the Lord to help me well he won't help you why not because he says he won't No, he won't help you to control it. God never excuses sin. What he does is execute it. He says, take it to the cross. That's the thing. Many of us are the old, like, like the old lady. She, she had a dog, a very, very nice dog given to her, a pedigree dog. It had a long, long tail. It should, it should have been cut off. Somebody asked her, did she have papers for the dog? She said, yes, all over the floor. But... <clears throat> The dog, you see, this dog should have no tail. It needs its tail cutting off right up to the rump there. Oh, I didn't know that. The man went a few months after the dog had half a tail. She said, you've done it wrong. You should, have, you should have cut it right up to its rump. No, she said, that's cruel. I cut two inches off every month. Well, that's what some of us try to do. You know, I don't think I'll be as carnal next year as I've been this year. I, I don't think I'll be as, you know, as touchy. I, I think I'll grow up next year. I don't think my temper will be as bad. I, I don't think I'll be as critical. I don't think I'll be as unkind. I don't think I'll be, uh, you know, so feeble in my prayer life. I, I, I don't think I'll be so self-centered. Again, read Romans 7. It's self-centered. 19 times I, I, I. Go into chat and then uh, go through the same chapter and, and count how many times the Holy Spirit is mentioned. He's not mentioned once. Why? Because it's a self-centered life. And you go into Romans chapter 8, the victorious life. Romans 7 is a funeral march. Romans 8 is a wedding march. Romans 8, 7 is bondage. Romans 8, Paul singing out of my bondage, sorrow and night, Jesus, I come. Romans then 7, 31 times, I, I, I. Romans 8, I only twice. When he says, I reckon and I am persuaded. But 19 times the Holy Spirit is mentioned because it's a spirit-dominated life in chapter 8. Do you remember some of those awesome words Jesus said to the disciples? I have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them. I say, Reverend the Almighty God, don't say that to me at the judgment seat. Don't let me stand before John Wesley and Finney and all the great saints of the ages. 
and say, Raveny, I had many things to tell you. You're so preoccupied with this, so preoccupied. I couldn't get through to you. And if I could, you weren't mature enough to handle it. Isn't it easy to spit texts out if you forgive that rough word? Isn't it easy to say, you know, in this generation, uh, we're going to fulfill the word of Jesus where he said, greater things than these shall ye do. Boy, I'd like to see us start with some of the lesser things right now. I'd like to see a bunch of men go and stay, say, I'm going to stay in, say, somewhere like, uh, well, if you like, nearby Dallas, though it's teeming with Bible schools and what have you got. But going to a city like Finidid and say, I'm not moving out of this city until there are two moves. Until God moves and the devil gets out of the place. We don't have anybody like that. We're fly by night. We want our big love offerings. We want glamour. Paul never glamorized the gospel. It's a pretty gory gospel. It's a bloody gospel. It's a sacrificial gospel. I believe the cardinal ethic of Christianity is sacrifice. Not success, sacrifice. Five minutes inside eternity, I believe every one of us will have wished that we'd sacrifice more, prayed more, loved more, sweated more, grieved more, wept more. After the Acts of the Apostles, the whole balance of the New Testament is to the church, it's not to sinners. Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica and says, I'm praying night and day. No, no, no. He says, I'm praying exceedingly. He's praying the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man for the church. Yes, for the church. Not that they'll get out of poverty. Not that they'll get out of slavery. He's praying what? He says, I'm praying night and day. What? He's praying for their faith. Praying night and day exceedingly that your faith may be strengthened. He starts the second epistle, the first chapter, verse 3, and says, I rejoice, what? That your faith groweth exceedingly. His prayer had been answered. They hadn't all just become millionaires or famous personalities. They hadn't all become evangelists and teachers and prophets. Those things are there, and I would to God they were more manifest than they are in these days. But these ministries were not given to boys and girls spiritually immature. It must have been a great thing to follow Jesus for three years. It must have been a great thing to be a Timothy. For all what love Paul showed on Timothy, he, he kind of says, this is my spiritual heir, he's coming after me. And see how much, read his epistles, if you want to know about preaching and teaching, read, read his epistles, the first and second of Paul to Timothy. But you know, Paul, isn't it amazing? Paul is the most profound theologian the church ever had. And usually when we talk about apostles, <coughs> we call John the apostle, the apostle of love. But he didn't write 1 Corinthians 13. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 13. Paul says, do you want to know what my, my success is, if he puts it that way? Do you know what it is? He, he, and he goes in, in the what, second chapter of Corinthians there, 5, and, and he recites, you know, if the earthly house is dissolved, we have a home in the heavens. And then he comes down and he says, do you know what the secret is? The love of Christ constrains me. I told Brother Tony about three months ago, I said, you know, I saw a very daring thing today. He said, what did you see? Oh, I said I was coming into a building and it said agape love on, on the outside of it. It's the greatest thing in the world. I said, Tony, what we've done, we've hung a sign on our gate that if you can't find divine love anywhere, you'll find it at Agape. If you can't find love that never breaks down, you'll find it at Agape. If you can't find love that beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, we'll never give up on you. I mean, we stuck it on the wall out there. Now, either it's true or we're hypocrites. Love. So amazing, so divine demands my soul, my life, my own. And the poet says, love ever stands with open hands and while it lives, it gives. For this is love's prerogative to give and give and give. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Christ loved the church and gave himself for the church. And if you love you, you he says, you'll give your life for your brethren. That doesn't mean you die for them. It means you'll share your life. 
It means every day when there's need, you supply that need. It's not just saying, well, shoot me instead of him. That, that, that's easy. Man, you'd be out of it. Before you could blink your eyes, you'd be in eternity. Got rid of taxation and everything. It would be wonderful. But when it comes down to sharing your life, it's a very, very different thing. You know, you can't find in the New Testament any place where some of the disciples were saved. <laughs> but you can find the place where they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, which is a type of the world, and they left Pharaoh, a type of the devil, when they came out of Egypt, they sang a song. It blew away on the breeze. But when they went, when they went into the promised land, Canaan, they built a permanent altar. They built a pile of stones, a permanent record that they were crossing into the promised land. A land flowing with milk and honey. And sometimes we suggest you get filled with the Spirit. That's the answer to all your problems. That's the end of all your problems. It is. The beginning end. That's where they start. Jesus was filled with the Holy Ghost and immediately led of the Spirit into the wilderness. Do you know what the baptism of the Holy Ghost can do for you? And boy, do we recite it. Sure we should do. I'll tell you what it did for those men in Acts 2. And so many people say, I've got an Acts 2 experience. But Acts 2 goes into Acts 3. Where did Acts 3 get them? In jail. It's jail. It's jail. It's bondage. The kind of bondage you put on a train when, when, the, when the engine's snorting down the line. And the only safety is that it's in control by those, by those two strips of metal. Otherwise, it's a lethal thing. And Madame Guillaume says, my freedom is thy grand control. The only, the only freedom in the world is to get into bondage to God. Out of the bondage of sin into bondage for God. Now look what he says in the 6th of Romans. Therefore we are buried with Christ. Therefore we are buried with him, by, with Christ, by baptism. We're buried into what? Into death. Verse 5. For if we have been planted in the likeness of his death, knowing this, that our old man, our old self, is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Now look, you're either serving God or serving self or serving sin. There's no other areas. Verse 7 is quite a text. He that is dead is freed from sin. No, no, it doesn't mean when this body dies. The next verse goes on. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also rise with him. Verse 9, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, death dieth no more, death hath no dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. I'll tell you what, when that happens, you never forget it. When you go to your own funeral, I will praise him. Look at the second stanza. Though the way seemed straight and narrow, all I claimed was swept away. My ambitions, plans, and wishes at my feet in ashes lay. I said in a meeting in Scotland as we closed it years back, I said, if you let this be true in your life, you'll, let, you'll bring your ambitions, your plans, your wishes, your own desires, your self-life, put it on the altar, God will burn it up, and he'll do more with the ashes than you can do with your entire personality. And I said, if you want this blessing, raise the hand. A dozen people raised the hand. And I said, anyone else? A little woman at the back raised her hand like that down. I said, I saw it. <laughs> she got flaming red hair. Fifteen years after, my dear wife and I were in Manchester at a missionary meeting. And the meeting was as flat as a pancake. Ugh, there was nothing in it. The last man to speak sat down. The man leading the meeting said, would you like to hear a testimony? Yes. And he asked a little red-haired woman. Uh, her legs were so short she couldn't even touch the car. She kept doing this while the preacher was preaching. I thought, yes, I'd kick him if I could get near him too. <laughs> but <clears throat> I think it's because her legs were short. 
And you know, she stood up and that sleepy audience that afternoon suddenly sprang to life on the edge of the sea. She says, I remember being in the Cherryfield Mission in Dundee, Scotland one afternoon. I went to hear a certain preacher. He couldn't come. Raven Hill preach. I said, no, that can't be that little red-haired woman. I used to be afraid to go out in the dark. I didn't face a mouse. I didn't face the darkness. I didn't want to be lonely. And she said, hallelujah, that afternoon... All I did was sweep the floor in the factory and the devil said, you know, the baptism of the spirit, the endowment with power is only for intellectuals and ministers and preachers and prospective missionaries. It's not for servant girls. It's not for a girl sweeping the factory of a floor. You've no education. But Ravenil said, bring what you have and let God burn it up. And she said, that was my lifeline. I ran to that altar that afternoon. And she said, the fire came and consumed all my desires and all my fears and all my tomorrows. I'm just back from Africa, been there nearly 15 years. Oh, I'm not afraid of mice, she said some nights. There's a lion at the door. <laughs> oh, she said, I turn over and say, go off, I'm not on the menu tonight. Sometimes I have to walk on a log in the, in the middle of the night with a man holding lights in front of me and there's a hippo with his mouth open or a crocodile. I deliver a baby and he says, I'll go back with you because uh, there's a man eating like... No, no, it's all right. She says, I come back singing, oh, blessed assurance. He took away my fear of man. He took away my fear of death. He took away my fear of consequences. And she said, that little hut is filled with the glory of God like the Shekinah temple. All out of a life that was so useless till I laid it all at God's feet. One last thing. <clears throat> but back in the 1930s, we were, we were preaching, doing crusades in England. We had a man by the name of Dan Phillips. Dan had a tremendous voice. <laughs> a voice. He'd been as, as wild as any man in World War I. <coughs> and he bore the scars of it, both in his mind, in his conscience, in his body. One day a young lady stopped him and talked to him about the Lord and he got marvelously saved. She was a beautiful young lady. And she coached him along and they went to meetings together and finally he fell in love with her. And they fixed a date for marriage. They went and bought all the furniture and stored it away. He was standing in a meeting one night and they were singing what the man said was a hymn of consecration. There's a wonderful atmosphere in the tabernacle in Manchester. Everybody felt God was moving. But Dan felt specially because they were singing this verse. Here, I give my all to thee, friends and time and earthly store. Soul and body thine to be, only thine forevermore. <clears throat> Let's sing that verse again, said the leader. Here I give my friends, and the Lord said, look, look this side. Here's the girl he's going to marry in so many months. Here I give my all to the friends. I want your friend. Time, I want your time. Your earthly store, all that furniture, sell it and go to college. And going out, he said to her, I, I've got to tell you something. It's very important. Well, why didn't you tell me last night? I didn't know. I didn't know till a few minutes ago in the meeting. In the meeting, yeah, yeah. As we were singing, here I give my all to thee, friends and time. I've sung that a hundred times, but I, I, I didn't sing it like today. We've got to postpone our wedding. Are you sure? Yeah. I tried to back off, but the Lord said, do you, do, do, do you love her more than you love me? My perfect will is that you, you postpone your marriage and you sell your goods and you go to Bible school. Well, she's a human being. Paul said none of these things move me. He didn't say none of these things hurt me. Her eyes filled with tears and she said, Dan, that's beautiful. I'm glad you love the Lord more than you love me. He went to Bible school. He was the most illiterate man in the Bible school. A friend of mine was at the college at the same time. 
And one night he got a burden of prayer and he jumped up. And he ran down the corridor in his pyjamas. It was a school with men only. And he ran down to what we call lecture hall number one. And he got down to pray. He prayed until the sweat poured out through his pyjamas. He couldn't even hear the door clicking, the door clicking, the door clicking, the door clicking, the door clicking. Before the hour was through, every man in the college was down on his face. That college has never had a revival before or since like that one. They were all preachers. They were men who eventually were scattered to the ends of the earth. You see, this silly nonsense, you can, you can have Jesus as your Savior but not as your Lord, is, is purely unscriptural. I believe we ought to be blazing mad about this situation. 95% of Christians in the nation are weak. God can't trust them with vision. He can't trust them with burden. You can't trust children with jewels. They've no sense of values. You can't trust them with something that needs bravery. They're too timid. You can't trust them with a burden. You'll break them. In the middle, and I'm through with this, in the middle of that marvelous, marvelous, unmatched hymn of love, that I'm sure was Paul's experience. He had found that love so amazing. He had found a love that's always patient, that's never rude. He had found that love that beareth all things, lashings, whippings. Even his revival party broke up. Spirit-filled men left him because they thought he was a fanatic. In the middle of that amazing chapter, it comes to a bump, I think, Brother God. I never understand it quite. He suddenly breaks off and says, When I became a man... I believe it was a conscious entry that just as surely as the children of Israel knew when they got through the water and stepped on the promised land and said, this is God's country, there came a place in his life where he knew. I believe it was after God had revealed himself to him and after God had revealed himself in him. And then in that three intense years of study, he'd even been caught up into the third heaven. Do you wonder you can't find two minutes backsliding in his life? I think he saw everything John saw, but God wouldn't let him write it down. Oh, yes, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. But between here and there, there's a thousand pitfalls. For some of you fellows, a pair of sparkling eyes. For some of you girls, a very promising young man that's going to be a great preacher and God wants you to burn your life out somewhere else. For some of you, just to be godly fathers and mothers, there's an awful scarcity of them right now. Says a hymn writer, along my sinful heart was striving to obtain this promised rest. But when all my struggles ended, simply trusting, I was blessed. If you come to this altar this morning, I'm going to ask you to come for one thing. Because all I know about an altar, it's for two things. Then, or in the Old Testament for sacrifice and for death. I could take you to the place where I knelt once when I was about 18. Considered to be the youth leader of the church and we'd seen some souls saved. I got the youth to meet on a Friday night at 7 o'clock. We prayed till 9. I got them to preach to, to, to meet at 6 o'clock Sunday morning and, and we prayed. I went out in Sherwood Forest and prayed by myself. Weep and groan because I'd read David Brainerd. He did it and I didn't know any better and I'm glad I did it. I'm not embarrassed. Nobody else showed me a pattern. I sometimes think God sent me back to America for what I learned out of that one brief, abridged book of David Brainerd. A man that died at 28 years of age, burned out for God. Broken, weeping. The altar is for sacrifice. Let's not cheapen it. The altar is for death. And then when we die, we rise again in newness of life. When the priest was anointed in the, what, Psalm 133, the oil, which is a continuous symbol of the Holy Ghost in Scripture, the oil was put upon his head and it ran down his face. No, no, it ran down his beard. And it ran off his beard onto his garments. And it ran off his garments onto the floor. It never touched the flesh. If you read about the 25th chapter there of Exodus, it says the anointing shall not come upon the flesh. 
If you're not in the flesh, you'll be cursed. There's so much flesh today. So much of me, of self, of self-pity, self-interest, self-glory. I say, if you come to this altar, come to die. Tell God I'm going to lose all my rights this morning. Tell him you'd rather live six months with the anointing of the Holy Ghost than another 60 years without it. Tell him you're pledging your hands and your feet and your mind, all you know and all you don't know. Bring that wretched pride that's always getting at you, that envy that's eating you up, that jealousy that mars you, that temper. Don't ask for help. Ask God to nail it to the cross. 